Okay, 2011, number four, and again, no calculator. So here we go. Uh, this is the graph of F. Um, it's continuous, and it's defined from negative four to three. That's inclusive. And it consists of two quarter circles and one line segment. And I'm also told that G of X is 2X plus the integral of F. First thing, find G of negative three. So that means all I'm doing is subbing in negative three to G of X. Every place I see an X, I'm subbing in a negative three. So looking at this first part, um, do, 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 do. So G of negative three is two times negative three, so we can get that, plus the integral from zero to negative three, because I'm subbing in for X, F of X DX. Now, I need to find the area under the curve of F from negative three to zero. That's my quarter circle right there. So it's one fourth pi r squared. So that becomes nine pi over four. However, is your lower limit actually at the bottom of your integral? No, so you must negate that. So your answer becomes negative six minus nine pi over four. Now part A also says find g prime. So we have to take the derivative of g. The derivative of 2x is 2, and then when I take the derivative of an integral, x is the upper limit, x goes in place of all my t's. So g prime is 2 plus f of x, that's your fundamental theorem of calculus, and then g prime of negative 3, we just sub that in, 2 plus f of negative 3. Well, to find f of negative 3, you have to go to your graph. This is the graph of f. So when x is negative 3, y is zero. So that's your final answer right there for part A. Part B, uh, I need to find the absolute maximum on a closed interval and I need to justify my answer. Okay, so for part B, what I'm looking at, here's my justification. I have a max when g prime is zero or DME and has a sign change of plus to minus. Now, g prime is two plus f of x. We found that in part A. So when does two plus f of x equal zero? Well, when f of x is equal to negative two. Now, if I look at my graph here, when does f of x equal negative two? If you picture that horizontal line at negative two, I'm gonna, it's gonna happen right here. Now, I don't know that exact spot. I need to find it. So I need to find the equation of this line segment so I can set it equal to negative two and solve. So I take the point zero three, and I'm gonna take the point three, negative three. And this is my scrap work over here. I find the slope of the line and I get negative two. And now I know the y-intercept is three because that was given to me on the graph. So my equation of the line, y equals negative two x plus three, y equals mx plus b. Now I wanna know when does that line, when does f of x equal negative two? Set them equal, solve, and I get x equals five halves. That's where this comes into play. So x equals five halves, which is two and a half, goes on my number line. Closed interval, negative four to three. I'm picking a point less than two and a half, so I pick zero. Now remember, this is getting subbed into g prime, which is equivalent to two plus f of x, so don't forget that. So two plus f of zero. f of zero is three, so that's gonna be positive. Now I need another number, so I'm gonna pick two and three quarters and sub that in. If I look at this, two plus, let's see here, if I look at two and three quarters, um, do, 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 I can sub that in for x, and I realize that two plus that value is going to be negative for me. So there you go. This forces me to have an absolute max at x equals five halves, okay? Part C, find all values on the interval for where G has a point of inflection and give a reason. So for part C, my inflection point is when G double prime is zero or D and E and has a sign change. Well, think about G double prime. Go back to the original function, G of X and G prime of X. If this is G prime, I need G double prime. So I take the derivative. The derivative of two is zero. The derivative of f is f prime. So g double prime is equal to f prime. That's where I got this piece of information right here. So if I wanna know when g double prime is zero or d and e, that means I really wanna know when f prime is zero or d and e. And if I'm looking at my graph, I'm looking for sharp turns, horizontal tangents, anything like that. 
So I definitely have a sharp turn at zero. But here's where you want to be careful. If you think about the slope of the tangent line when x is negative 3, you're going to have a vertical tangent line at negative 3. And the slope of a vertical tangent line is DNE. So negative 3 counts as a point on this graph where the derivative does not exist. So you have to include that on your number line. Negative 3 and 0 are points where the g double prime, which is f prime, is 0 or DNE. To get my sign change, I'm looking at increasing and decreasing. And my function is increasing, increasing, decreasing. Therefore, I have a point of inflection at 0. Now, part D. Here's these theorems again, the mean value theorem. Find the average rate of change from negative 4 to 3. No problem. There's no point in between negative, excuse me, negative 4 and 3 for which f prime is equal to that average rate of change. Explain why this statement does not contradict the mean value theorem. So what this means is that the mean value theorem will support this conclusion that I will not find a point where the derivative is equal to the slope of the secant line. Let's see what happens here. I find the average rate of change from negative 4 to 3 using my graph, using the points given to me, and I get negative 2 over 7. MVT says that if f is continuous and differentiable on a given interval, then it's guaranteed that we will find a spot, a point, where the derivative is equal to the slope of the secant line of that interval. But f is not differentiable on that interval, therefore this will not happen. So therefore, MVT is correct and it supports everything that Part D is saying.